Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome back to the podcast, guys. It's Russell here, back with my co-host, Jose. And uh, we got an episode today talking about Jose being successful on his first carp. You want to tell us about it, Jose? <laughs> uh, yeah, man, sure. So um, in case you know, maybe you're new and you haven't heard in some previous episodes, I have been trying to catch a carp on the fly for the longest time. Uh, common carp, grass carp, didn't matter. If you've seen the video, if you follow us on, on Instagram or my personal page, I, I posted a, uh, a story to, to my page and um, mentioned that it was like my first carp. I guess technically that may or may not be true because I did catch a koi once before. I forgot about that, but I was just so excited and caught up in the moment. I just, that was just the first thing that came to my, to my mind. So my first carp in Texas, for sure. And yeah. my first carp, I guess, of what would be considered the uh, more common species one could find here in Texas. I don't see koi fish or I don't see koi um, really ever. Um, so, yeah, so I was pretty excited, man. So how it all started was I had to bring my buddy to the airport in Houston. And so I decided that I would take the opportunity to uh, maybe do a little bit of fishing around Houston and because I don't, I don't get to go there often. It's a little bit of a drive, a little out of the way since I, I live in College Station. I fished there before a time or two with my buddy um, and have done pretty well, not for carp specifically, just in general, we went to some places around there and I really enjoyed it. But uh, needless to say, it's not something I, I do very often. So um, I figured since I was already gonna be there, um, I might take the opportunity to do some fishing. So. I uh, actually I have a book right here. So the night before, actually not even the night before, I should have looked at it the night before. The morning of, I decided to look through this book that was written by my buddy Rob McConnell called Fly Fishing Houston in Southeastern Texas. And it's, an, it's a fantastic resource for anybody who lives or fishes or wants to fish in and around the uh, Houston area. It's also a great read if you just want to read it. I mean, yeah. I, I can't even think of a time that I would even be in Houston to go fishing. I really have nothing to take me there other than just fishing. And there's a lot closer places for me to go just for fishing. And so I don't foresee myself going there anytime in the near future. And, and I've been reading it myself. It's a, it's a very interesting read and it's also very informative if you are going to go fishing in the area. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a wealth of knowledge. Like, like Russell said, even if you don't fish in Houston or plan to fish in Houston, I think one could stand to learn quite a bit just skimming through the pages. It's really well written, really well organized, easy to navigate. It was pretty awesome. So I'm not going to name any water bodies because I don't want to spot burn, even though they were mentioned in the book. I guess that's one more reason to check out the book. But there was a one particular water body that was mentioned in the book for carp specifically that I wanted to check out. But um, I, as I was skimming through, I had briefly read um, that it was like, supposed to be better fishing in the winter or something like that. Or maybe it was that specific reach, or maybe I didn't read enough context as I was just skimming through really quickly while I was waiting for my coffee to, uh, to finish up. And so I was like, man, so I just, I just scrapped the idea of going there kind of all together. I figured I might go check it out as a last ditch thing, but it wasn't, um, something that I was going to do like immediately. So, I figured that, and it was, and you know, it's Tex, in Texas is getting freaking hot right now. It's heating up so bad. And I didn't know how much time I would actually have to fish anyways, but I packed my stuff just in case. So I packed my, um, my rod that I just built. Actually, I built it for the purposes of carp fishing. So I figured it'd be a good time to um, kind of test it out, or at least hopefully have the opportunity to test it out. And I, um, so I have, it's, it's built on a seven foot 11 Pelagos glass blank. It's a six, seven weight rod is a fiberglass rod. I have some, uh, snake brand guides on it. And then I have for the stripping guide, it is a 
I think it's Snake Brand also. Um, yeah, I have that, and then just you know, Corp. Nothing, nothing fancy. Just Corp, plain Corp, real, uh, real grip, and then a I believe it's a CRB real seat and a fighting butt. I wanted my I wanted this rod to have a fighting butt so I could have a little bit more leverage. The reel that I was fishing with with it or fishing on it uh, before was a it was a Reddington Behemoth seven eight size. And I didn't really like it. So the the I've never had this problem before with any other real seat or or that that I've used. But for whatever reason, the behemoth real foot is kind of big and it doesn't sit in the real seat very well. So whenever I cast it, you can feel it kind of shifting around. And for a while I thought it was maybe the epoxy or um, that I used to glue the real seat in the grip kind of starting to fall apart. So I was really scared that it screwed up the rod. So I, I stopped using it and I tried it with a different reel to see if it was the real foot. And I'm glad to say that it was in fact, just the real foot not matching up with the real seat. And so I have currently a um, size two TFO NTR, which is a great little reel for the price. I think it's one of my favorites for the, for the money. Uh, I think it's really hard to beat. And, uh, and so I'm going to probably buy another NTR specifically for this rod. I just ripped that reel off of another rod that I, that I had. And it has um, some six-weight airflow uh, power taper line, I think it is. <clears throat> Not really a trout or, sorry, carp line, but um, it's all I had. So just put that together. I grabbed some carp flies um, that I've tied, put them in my bag, threw them on the truck, drove to Houston, dropped them off. And then... Um, I actually drove straight from the airport to Bayou City Angler. Uh, I was going to try and make a stop at the shop since I hadn't been there since it moved locations, which was, I think, I think the the uh, worker there said that it was like a year ago, year and a half ago, or something like that. So, so it's been some time. So needless to say, it had been a while, and so I just stopped, wanted to pop in and check it out. And um, so I, I, I popped in, and I was talking with the worker. I believe his name is Tommy. Uh, don't know if he'll listen to this, but Tommy, what's up, dude? Uh, thanks again for all your help. So Tommy and I were just talking I, after like, I, I, I checked out this, this store and, uh, we got to talk. He asked me, he was, Hey man, you've been doing any fishing? I was like, no, nah, dude, I haven't, I haven't gone in a while. I was like, actually I brought my fishing gear just in case, you know, I, I get the chance to fish out here. And I was like, yeah, what about you? He goes, yeah, man, sometimes I go and, um, uh, try and check out some carp, you know, by this place that I live and stuff like that. I was like, nice, dude. That's actually that's kind of what I wanted to try and uh, and uh, and target while I was here if I had the chance. He goes, do you know where you want to go? And I was like, I mean, not really. And again, so at this point, I had kind of already, you know, this kind of uh, discarded the idea of going to this particular water body. He was actually he mentioned that specific spot, and he was like, yeah, I've been doing pretty well here. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, dude. If you want to check it out, and he kind of gave me like a little location uh, just to kind of start out at. And so I left there and I went straight to that spot and uh, just to kind of see. And he also gave me some other like uh, some other information, like kind of how to fish with these fish. And because it is a way different game than what I'm than what I've normally seen or I'm used to when it comes to carp fishing. And so, um, yeah, man, I, I, I parked. I started following this, uh, this little creek or I guess technically it's a bayou. Um, so I started following this, the, the water I was going, uh, down current, I think, and, um, found a map and I found this, these, these fish, these grass carp and, um, a bunch of mullet too. And so I worked my way down to where they were and they were just kind of, there cruising on the, actually they were, they were feeding. It looked like they were eating algae or something. So I, uh, and I found, I saw these other fish. I didn't know what they were, man. I had no idea. And so I just kind of sat there and I just watched them for a bit, trying to figure out what they were. And it turned out to be a pretty sizable school of tilapia, which I've never seen in the wild. So this was my first time actually seeing some tilapia. You've never seen them in New Braunfels? Uh, I can't say I have. Well, I don't fish New Braunfels very often. If I, if I go there, it's for, the, it's for the quad. And I, I never see them there. Uh, I see. I've seen quite a few of them in the Brownfield, San Antonio area and stuff like that. I've, I've heard that they're never caught one though. Yeah. I've heard they're around, but I've just, I've just never seen them. So this is my first time kind of seeing them and I'm fairly certain they were tilapia. 
Um, uh-huh. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty sure just based on like the body shape and stuff like that. And I, and I know they're in Houston cause I have my, my buddy, uh, slash roommate, he used to fish in, in, in often, or sorry, in, in Houston fairly often when he would go visit his then girlfriend and stuff like that. And, and he has caught tilapia. So I know what they look like. He showed me photos and stuff like that. And, it, and they seemed to have a pretty similar build. So I just assumed that's what they were. But there were some pretty nice size ones in the school, man. So I decided to, um, and the grass carp are kind of being kind of finicky. So these these fish, they're just like in, in feeding mode. They didn't really spook very much. So what I would do is, I mean, I, I was trying to cast everything. I think at that point, I, I tied up this little like BS carp fly that I put together. It had like a uh, like a chartreuse. What is that called, man? It's like a, it's a San Juan, it's a, it's like a San Juan worm tied with like a gummy like material. I can't remember what, what that stuff is called. Uh, squirmy wormy. Squirmy wormy. Yeah. So I had like the squirmy wormy material, right? It's mm-hmm. chartreuse. And I just used that for the tail. I think the body is um, made from creeper chenille, and then I think I made a little collar from uh, some soft tackle, olive soft tackle. It was all olive except for the the chartreuse tail. And it was cut and uh, it was tied on a, uh, I want to say it was some brass dumbbell eyes and a Bonillo carp hook from Fooling Mills. And uh, so there's this little like random thing I put together one night. And uh, so I decided. Sounds super fishy though. It, I mean, it worked. So I, I tied it on and actually I, I, put, I put like a little like 12 inch section of uh, a fluorocarbon, nine pound fluorocarbon from Portland. And um uh, mm-hmm. So I was throwing that and they just weren't eating it. I had a few kind of follow it, but, and maybe nip at it a little bit, but none fully committed. And then what I started doing is I was throwing up current and letting the current kind of swing it into the school. And so what I, this one time I did that man and I didn't even feel it or see it hit. I was just kind of like stripping it back so I can try and cast again. And I felt some resistance and so I kind of just gave it like a little half ass like hook set, if you will. And then I felt weight and I see this fish like turn his head and he starts like taking off and pulls line. And, and, uh, I had it on my, for a little bit. It was a really nice size tilapia, dude. It was, I mean, it was just nuts. It all happened so fast. And then I had it on for maybe like 15 seconds and it got off. Like it spit the hook. I never got a solid hook Damn. set. Um, because I didn't, I didn't see it or I didn't feel it. I was pretty bummed about that, but it was also really excited, you know, because I was like, okay, so these fish are willing to play ball, you know? So right. I um, kind of backed off a little bit and uh, gave them some space. I had to re-rig. I wanted to change my fly because I figured they may, I, they may have gotten used to that when they probably won't hit it again. So I switched to a, um, little like olive nymph thingy and i ended up losing it in some grass so from there i switched to an olive brass hawk the reason i was going olive is because i saw them feeding on algae i figured that might give me the best chance of actually getting hooked right so i started finding some more grass carp and i just could not get them to eat dude and and the and after that hooking that one fish the tilapia became really 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 skittish and so i just i just couldn't hook up with them again I was getting really, really frustrated and it was getting hot, man. It was heating up so fast. I think at this point it was already probably 10, 30, 11 in the evening or sorry, in the morning. And so it was, it's, it was heating up really, really quick. And, uh, I finally found, I walked down a little more and I finally found some low grass carp. And so I, I, I kind of took a second, calmed down, recomposed myself. And I remembered something that, that the guy at the fly shop told me. He said that fish in that particular area, they eat more like out of a reaction than anything. So you, you, so accuracy is paramount. Like you have to drop it like near their face, and not. And if they're in the if they're in the mood to feed, they'll go after it. So yeah, I saw this 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 grass carp. And it looked like he was feeding, so I cast it to it, and sure enough, man, I hit maybe an inch or two from its face. And I saw him turn on it and he's like, and I didn't really see him eat, but I kind of felt like he did. And so I just went for the hook set anyways, just kind of like in the koi fish in Arkansas. I just went for Uh the hook set to see what would happen. And yeah, man, I mean, it was just instant weight. The fish starts freaking out and he takes off and I was just ecstatic. I could not believe that that had happened. And so 
I fought this fish for a little bit, got it tired. And then it just became a point of like, how am I going to get it? Because I'm fishing on the top of like this embankment. There's a pretty, you know, steep gradient. Right. And I didn't know how I was going to get down there without falling in. And so I, I started walking downstream to see if I could find some uh, stairs or something. Cause I had seen some stairs built in um, on my way, on my, on my walk to the spot. And sure enough, well, I didn't really see stairs, but I see like uh, some cracks in the seam of the concrete with some rebar that kind of looked like steps. And I was able to kind of uh-huh. slide down, like inch my way down uh, to the, to the water's edge. And I was able to get that fish, man, finally got it. I was super pumped. And it was kind of funny because on my way downstream, I was, it, was, it, look, it looked like I was walking a dog. Like, I had my rod bent <laughs> over and this, this poor, this poor carp was just kind of cruising along. You know, I felt, I felt bad, but that was the only way I was going to be able to get it. And, uh, and I actually saw, I ran into even more carp. Like they were just everywhere, dude. They were stacked. And I saw some buffaloes. I don't think I saw any commons. Um, I don't remember seeing any tilapia. I don't think I, I think they probably busted out of there. But I just saw a bunch of fish and I was, I was like, okay, I probably spooked these fish, but I don't really care. I was too excited to care. So I got this, I got this fish, got it unhooked and all that stuff. And then I got up and managed to get myself out of, like off the embankment up on top to where, uh, without falling in. So I start walking back and I noticed that these, there were still carp hanging around. Like they fully, it looked like they hadn't fully gotten like, uh, like, scared, like scared, I guess, you know? So I saw these two. Uh, and I started casting at one and I mean, I was like hitting it on the head every time. Didn't care. I was like, all right, that fish isn't going to eat. So I, I picked a different fish out and I actually, and I actually kind of like overshot a little bit and went behind it a little bit, but I guess I, it smacked the fly smacked the water hard enough. And maybe the fish saw it just enough that it actually wheeled around and chased it down. And, uh, really? yeah, dude, it was really aggressive. Like I didn't expect that. And I set the hook again. And so like not even two minutes after releasing the first fish hooked up on my second grass cart with the same fly. And, um, even after like walking it through there, it didn't spook or nothing like that. I was really, really surprised. Couldn't believe it. Fought this fish. I, I went down the same way that I, that I went down for the other one, but I, um, and, and again, like kind of, I mentioned, if any of you listened to our, free, our previous podcast with, uh, with Josh or our Vic, as we call them, I mentioned how I, I have since lost so many fish that I carry nets. Well, I didn't bring a net. And so <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I didn't bring a net and uh, actually I take it back. I did bring a net, but I left it in the truck. And so I, uh, grabbed the line, the leader rather. And it broke at the knot where I connected the fluorocarbon tippet to my main leader. And, uh, which is fine. Like, to be honest, those grass carp kind of stink. And I was, and I didn't want (laughs) to risk, you know, getting like going to the canal. So I was cool with just, you know, letting it go that way. So, um, after that, I just reeled up my line and called it a day. It was by this time, it was probably noon, 1230 something like that. And, uh, it was just so hot, man. It was so hot. Actually, I called you like, as soon as I got that, that, that I hooked that or lost that fish rather. I, uh, I called you and I was like, bro, and I was so ecstatic, man. And, um, dude, you were, yeah, dude, I was out of breath from like all the adrenaline, like trying not to fall in and climbing up out of that steep embankment stuff. And, uh, I found a little shade, a little tree that had some shade. So I just kind of stopped there and, uh, drank some water, just, try to relax a little bit because dude it was it was i it was hot and i didn't take into consideration the effect that the sun would have with the concrete like i could feel the water the heat radiating off the concrete and i i didn't think about that and so yeah. i didn't realize like how hot it actually was how hot i actually was i was like sweating through my shirt i mean i was it was it was not a good situation. Probably I, I was probably not too far off from like heat exhaustion or whatever. Cause I felt at one point, like I wanted to throw up. That's also because like I hadn't really drank much water that day or I hadn't eaten breakfast either. So I just, it was not a good situation really going into it. There are certain things I would do different now if, I, you know, well, actually not if, but when I go back. And so, um, but yeah, so after that I walked and then I, you know, got in my truck, went to the restaurant, and uh, just sat there in the AC, ate some food, drank a lot of fluids, trying to recover. 
And uh, but yeah, man, that was my little my little trip, my little quick trip prep fishing in Houston. And uh, after that, I went to Gordian Sons, which is another fantastic little fly shop. And then uh, I went back to Bayou City, and and uh, and I was like, and, I, and that guy was still working. I was like, dude, and I had I had to shake his hand. I was like, man, thank you so much. Like be, be, between him and the information he provided, in addition to the information that was provided by by Rob and that book. I was able to be successful on my first trip, actually like canal fishing in Houston. So um, I can't say enough good things about this book and its uh, ability to be a good resource for urban anglers and uh, also the just the awesome service and the awesome uh, people who work down at Bayou City Anglers, like stand up guys, like no BS, um, super willing to help just some, you know, just a stranger, some dude walking in the shop. So I can't say enough good things about those dudes in that shop so it's a it's a pretty cool trip pretty quick trip but one well worth it caught my first two grass carp and i'm super happy to say that the rod performed as good if not better than i was hoping it would uh, i freaking love it and uh and uh I actually i'm planning on building another rod in the future but yeah dude i'm super super stoked finally got to check that one off now i just got to get a common carp at some point, I just don't know when that'll happen. But yeah, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm just so stoked. I'm still so stoked. And also, I want to go back and catch that and catch that tilapia I lost because it was a tank, dude. It was one of the bigger ones in that group. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. I want to catch a tilapia so bad. I've casted at so many of them and just have been unsuccessful. I've never casted at them on the fly though. This last time I was over there fishing, um, I want to say it was probably maybe. 2014 or before oh wow um, okay and so yeah i was i was out there bass fishing i caught you know a few largemouth few spots out of the body of the water that i was fishing and i was if i'm not mistaken was throwing a a baby brush hog or a oh, cinco yeah. um texas rig so uh, i was catching bass on that and i just don't see tilapia eating that for some reason i just i, I don't really know what they yeah. eat to be honest but um they didn't seem interested in the slightest at what i was throwing so but I do want to. Yeah. So today I started looking up a little bit about different uh, tilapia flies, and so I have an idea of what I want to what I want to tie, and it's essentially what I'm going to do is a modified Rio getter because tilapia's mouths, from what I've seen, they're I guess they're kind of small, but but they eat like algae. And stuff. I saw them eating algae, so I'm probably going to tie like a really small, like maybe size eight or ten. Um, olive colored fly probably with that little chartreuse squirmy wormy tail again and uh and just see if i can get one on because that seemed to work pretty well they didn't like any of the other flies that i tossed at them so um i'm just gonna take i'm just gonna i'm just gonna utilize some parts of the fly that did work but scale it down and see if maybe yeah. that'll, that'll that'll make it a bit more appealing to them but yeah dude you need to come bro you need to come. I need to. Again, we're going to go fish the canals. I think you dig it. It's a it's a different game for sure, but it's uh, it's pretty neat, man. Urban fishing is underrated, I think. Um, I haven't done too much of it, but I want to. It's well, yeah. So I don't get me wrong. I love fishing the hill country. I love fishing in like more natural places. But if you mm -hmm. live in and around Houston, if that's all you got. I think you have some untapped potential in your fingertips. And that goes for any place like uh, San Antonio river, for example, dude, I have a buddy. Uh, maybe we can get him on some time, but, uh, and hopefully we can get Rob too, man. Um, I think Rob, Rob's a cool, really, really cool dude. This is the second book he actually wrote. The first one was Sam. You sent, uh, fishing the, the Sam fly fishing, the Sam yeah, fly fishing, the Sam, which is also another great resource and, uh, another really cool little fishery. I think it's one of Texas best kept secrets when it comes to, um, fly fishing. It's, it's freaking fantastic. One of my favorite places to go to, but he's, I mean, I think he'd be a great, great guy to have on the podcast, but, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah. So urban fishing. So yeah, I love fly fishing the hill country. I love fishing natural areas, but you know, if, if you're in the city, like I think there's some untapped potential there, especially in Houston. I mean, I, yeah, and it'll yeah. also be a nice change of scenery for those that are always out in rural areas, you know. Yeah, uh, I think that's I mean, what's so appealing to me is uh, that I want to do some urban fishing and I also want to go to South Florida and fish some ditches and catch some exotics. You know, it's just it's a change of scenery. Urban fishing in Florida is going to be, yeah, like 
peacocks, man, Mayan cichlids, jack jaguars. Yeah, I mean, like little even even tarpon, like baby tarpon, make their ways into like the the canals and stuff there too, dude. Yeah, urban fishing, Florida, it's got to be some of the coolest fishing, urban at least urban fishing that you can do, dude. It's freaking. We got to go do that. Granted, too. majority of them are invasives. But, I mean, <laughs> but, dude, um, almost, well, I mean, they're, they're, I would say they're naturalized almost, at this point. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, in, invasive, exotic, like they're terms that are used often interchangeably, but they have different meanings. Um, exotic yeah. just means that you're, they're pretty much like non native, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're invasive. Invasive just means like they can cause economic damage as well as environmental damage and stuff like that. Um, and so the, I don't, I mean, peacocks could be considered invasive. I'm not really sure on their ecology and what their role is in the systems in Florida. Uh, they very well. Yeah, and how they impact indigenous species yeah, and whatnot. Exactly. And so they very yeah. well might be, but, um, but yeah, so uh, I guess uh, an example of, an exotic species that is not native or not really invasive uh, or I guess a naturalized species now uh, that's not really invasive, actually largemouth, like Florida strain largemouth, um, I uh-huh. think are technically considered uh, naturalized because they're not really native outside of their Florida range from what I understand. Like before they were introduced to Texas, I think most of Texas was um most of the strains here were like northern bass, northern largemouth bass, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now there's a vast majority of the genetics have been altered and, and include genetics from Lord, uh, Florida strain largemouth. I yeah, think. And I know a lot of people will stock Florida strain just for the good genetics and the size. Yeah, because they get messed. Um, I, and obviously, you know, they'll interbreed and whatnot. People put them in their ponds. Ponds get flooded, or uh, if they do breed, then eggs get carried by birds and other other animals and. So yeah, it's kind of a a big thing that's that's uh, yeah. I I would say naturalized though because yeah. it's not really hurting the indigenous species of bass. Brown trout too. Yeah, brown trout is another one. There's a lot of areas yeah. that uh, most people think they're native when they're not that they're introduced pheasants for recreation. Pheasants, I believe, come from Asia, but they I mean they're all over. They're a really popular game bird now. And mm-hmm. they, I don't see them going anywhere. So. Um, but yeah, so there's a, and I'm not a geneticist. My, the, the degree I'm working on is not in um, like invasive or exotic species ecology, nothing like that. This is just from my limited understanding of, um, of those terms that, you know, that we discussed whenever I was going to school. So, and, and um, so, yeah, so I could be rusty. I could be wrong, very, very likely wrong, but those are, that, but to my <laughs> understanding, that's just how it goes, at least for largemouth bass. I need to do, right. I do want to do more research just for my you know, own personal understanding. Cause I think that is a pretty interesting to- story. Um, uh, but yeah, anyways, so urban fishing, it can be a really, really cool deal. And uh, if you ever, if you're in Houston, like if you go there for work, or if you have family members or friends that live there and you visit them every so often, I think it is worth checking out. And if you're going to check it out, check out Rob's book as well. I think it'll, it'll point you in the right direction or at least give you an idea. And uh, I wish Rob was here to discuss this because I know that there are a lot of people out there who do not appreciate having uh, spots burnt. You know, like they don't like spots yeah. being discussed online and stuff like that. And I'm kind of that way to an extent, but I guess the way I think about it is that just because someone knows of a spot doesn't mean that they can be successful. Like they don't, that doesn't mean that they know how to fish it. I think that's exactly every spot is different in its own. Yeah. And I, and I think, um, I think that's what makes the difference. Right. And so with, this, right. and so at least with fly fishing, the Sam, and I think he's done the same with this book is he doesn't, he gives like, locations for people to start but encourages them to explore if that makes any sense like he's not really yeah. burning spots like if i mean if you drive through houston you've passed by these places and just because you know these places doesn't guarantee you're going to be successful you still need to learn how to fish for those fish in that spot you know maybe they're super exactly. skittish in that spot more so than than in others 
you know, and, and so I know a lot of people get all butt hurt. I think he met a little bit uh, or may have ruffled some feathers with the release of this book. And I think it was kind of the same for Aaron Reed and his book uh, in, the Hill, in Austin, the surrounding Hill Country. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know, dude. I I personally think it's pretty cool that someone has gone through all the legwork to do this and to just to give it um, a resource to people who are interested. It doesn't guarantee their success. It just gives them a place to start. That's just right. my personal and, and the way that they're formatted, uh, in my opinion, is so I, I haven't read Aaron Reed yet. I have it. It's sitting over here on the couch behind me. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I have read uh, Rob's book. And there, that's actually part of a four book series. There's going to be two more two more books coming out. Uh, I don't remember the titles, of the other two or who the authors of them will be, um, but it is going to be a four book series. Um, but the way that they're formatted is more for getting people out, getting them to explore. And a lot of the places that are gone into detail about from what i've seen are places that are well-known places as yep. it is they're not like little honey holes where it's like okay where well, you're going to go behind this tree and take this curve and that's the spot where you're going to catch this species exactly. it is very detailed yeah but it's not detailed to the point to where it's going to burn honey holes they're well-known areas and areas that people pass every day exactly and actually a, a, a like case in point from my own personal experience with this exact like what you and i are talking about right now so when his first book, Fly Fish in the Sand, came out, I bought it. And there was a spot that was maybe, I, I don't know exactly how far it is from our place. I, I'd have to look. But it, it was one of the closer spots. So me and my buddy went down there one day. This was during the whole virus lockdown stuff. We went down there one day. And we got there based off of some information he provided in the book. But when we went, we only caught. I don't know, between he and I, just a couple of fish. It was still a lot of fun. We explored a pretty cool little reach. But, and we actually made a post about it on Instagram. And Rob himself contacted us. That's kind of how we met him. And he invited us to go fishing with him at that same spot. Mm -hmm. So when we went that next time, he showed, like, we went the opposite direction of where my roommate and I had gone by ourselves. And not only that, but he, he himself kind of gave us some pointers like where to cast, what to look for, what kind of flies to use, stuff like that. And our success on that trip was astronomical compared to what we had beforehand. So that's a perfect example of like just because you tell somebody where to go doesn't mean they're going to do well. And we only right. did well that one time because we had Rob himself helping us out. And, uh, and that's – information that he gained from his own blood, sweat, and tears, his own intellectual yeah. capital that he gained through the years. just Exactly. There. And spending season in and season out at these locations. Exactly. So I mean, he's fished yeah. it during the summer, during the winter, like you name it, he's done it. And he's fished. I can I, I couldn't tell you how many miles a guy's probably put on, you know, boots to the ground exploring this Creek. So yeah, we need to get right. him on. I'd love to get his opinion on that. Cause it seems to be a hot topic. I've noticed whenever books like this are being released, a lot of conversation um, it's, it's pretty interesting to me, I think. And, uh, and it kind of also like begs the question. So I don't know if you've, have you ever heard of another podcast, Russell called a uh, cut and retie with Joe Cermelli? I have not. It's a, it's a, so it's, it's a fishing in general. It's not like fly fishing specific or conventional fishing specific. He, uh, he, you know, they talk about everything, fly fishing, offshore fishing. Like it doesn't matter as long as it's fishing, right? It's a really good podcast. Joe Cermelli is a fantastic host. Like that dude, uh, man, he's he's so great. I, I enjoy his style, and it's really interesting. And um, but anyways, in this one podcast, I can't remember what he was talking about, but he was actually talking about with, with the guest that there's a website, and I can't remember what it's called, but what that website would do is um, it, it's kind of I, – I, I'm going to probably butcher it, but – they talk about selling information. So, so they would sell like, you know, they would, they would sell waypoints, right? Like mm -hmm. for 70, for like $75, you'll get like a package and the package includes so many waypoints, information about the, the, the lures to, that they use, how to use it and all that stuff. To me, that's a little bit different than what these books are. I don't, necessarily like that idea per se 
it sounds um, kind of shady. It's like a black market. Yeah. <laughs> just the way that and it, it, it's and kind it, of... Uh, it sounds almost hypocritical because these two things are almost like conceptually, right? Conceptually, they're a little similar. Like they're, yeah. they're aids to help fishermen and stuff. But at least with the books, in my opinion, they, I think, allow for your own personal growth as an angler. So they just gives you... Like, like we said before, it's just a place to start. And then from there, you right. can go and figure it out yourself. Whereas with this other thing, like, for example, I think they, I think an example they use, like there was a, a, a person there selling a package where they had so many waypoints, including the exact waypoint where they hooked like a nine plus pound large mouth or something like that. And what they used to catch it or something that, that seems to be focused mainly on profit for exactly. them though. And, and I think exactly. that's the thing for me is, okay, you buy a book for $20, $30 and you, you have some personal gain from it. You learn some things you wouldn't have learned and it gives you some information as opposed to, okay, you give me $75 and I'm going to tell you exactly where I caught this fish using what. It just seems a little more shady. Yeah. To, to be offering that instead of in the form of a book and an educational way to get information across. Exactly. To me, to me, these two things, these two mediums are very different to someone else. Oh, for sure. To, to someone else, they, they might seem similar. And I can see how one would, one would think that they're similar. But I don't know, man. Conceptually, to me, like, yes, like conceptually, they're very similar in ideology, I guess. But in, in terms of function, I think they're very, very different. And, uh, but yeah, Agreed. it's just, I don't know, man. I just found that to be interesting. But anyways, um, like I said, Rob's just a buddy. Hopefully I'm, I'm going to talk to him. Hopefully we can get him on, on board. He can, uh, I'd love to ask him these questions and get his input. And he, I know he's done a few interviews already uh, when his book was being released, uh, mm-hmm. first being released with some, on some other podcasts. And, uh, I don't think actually we, we, we did have, have ours up and running on the release of the book, but we weren't really like, not that we're big now, but at least we have more listeners now than we did before. So I would, right, right. I was just waiting for a better time to, to have them on. But I guess now would be a good one. So I'll reach out to him. But uh, yeah, man. Anyways, awesome book. Check it out. And uh, you can get it on Amazon, right? Yes, I believe so. Amazon. I, Do you I, know if it's at Barnes and Nobles or anything like that? Books of America. I, I want to say it's on Barnes and Nobles, but I, I, I don't know for certain. Uh, I see. Yeah, I got mine on Amazon. So. Yeah, I. Uh, this is my first time using the book in that capacity. I've skimmed through it before, but I, I can tell you now that it is certainly worth it from my own personal experience. Like the information is pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. So long story short, I guess that's how my my carp trip or fishing trip in Houston went. I just I just stuck that's around freaking there awesome, for man. a little bit. Went back home. That was a really long winded explanation. Sorry. Sorry uh, uh, to our audience for <laughs> <laughs> making it longer than this shit up. But, uh, Dude, low-key, whenever you called me. So I had just gone through the uh, drive-thru of Whataburger. And I, I was already in a great mood because of that. Because you know me, I love Whataburger. And I don't have one close to me here in Arkansas. And I've been working in Mississippi. And there's one there close to where I'm working. And so uh, I got it yesterday. And I got it again today. Don't judge me. Um, <laughs> yesterday, I just pulled out of the drive through Whataburger and you called and I was just like, all right, so I'm going to answer whatever. And then I hear you breathing heavy and immediately what went through my mind is like, oh, crap, are you OK? Like, like what's going on? And then you're like, dude. And I was like, OK, this is a good heavy breathing. <laughs> and, and you were so freaking stoked. I swear I could hear your smile through the phone. I was so excited for you. Oh, man, I appreciate it. Yeah, dude, I didn't even know what to do. Like, but I was like, I just got I got to call Russell. <laughs> so, <laughs> dude, that's freaking awesome. I'm glad you finally got on your carp. Oh, man. That's man. awesome. I, so I, the only times I've ever seen grass carp are um, in urban areas or in, like, ponds and stuff. So there's a little uh, uh, burger shack kind of close to where I live, and there's a pond at a residence behind it and there are some huge grassies in there and it's like, God, I want to cast it up so bad. So, so, but yeah, I've, I've never had the chance to cast at them before. Yeah. So I've only briefly looked into this. So forgive me if I've mixed up some facts and things, but to my understanding, grass carp are, are actually invasive. Like I think in Texas, if you want to stock them anywhere, you have to get a permit, a triploid permit or something like that. And essentially what mm-hmm. they are, they're, they're essentially um, sterile carp, so they can't reproduce. Yep. And uh, 
and certain waterways have them. And if you catch and and there's a there's a, a website at Parks and Wildlife where you can see, I guess, where they've been released, like um, where triploid permits exist. But mm-hmm. from my understanding, I, I looked at it earlier, is that if you catch a grass carp outside of an area that has a triploid permit, you have to dispatch them. They, really? Yes. They encourage you to kill them um, by removing their guts or killing them, whatever. They just, they just essentially, you just cannot release them. Once you catch them, you can't release them. And uh, so in this part in Houston, I believe, where where I fished, I believe it was near a location that had a triploid permit. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, so it was. I'm not. That's something you might want to look into. I didn't know this before going into it, and so yeah, uh, it might make things a little bit more com- uh, complicated. Now, common carp don't necessarily have that. Uh, common carp are considered to be invasive, although that can kind of be. I guess it's kind of dependent upon the area. Um, yeah. I don't. I think at this point they're more naturalized than they are invasive. There's actually yeah. a, a, a organization um, in Austin that's big on like carp and carp fishing, and uh, I, I don't think they're they're really invasive. I guess it can be, but uh, generally where where we've seen them in our lakes and rivers and stuff, I don't think they are. Uh, right and i guess the density of the population is is also yeah. makes a huge difference in a lot of areas if they do get too dense i can see how they'd be more uh yes exactly you, yeah. you know you know more dangerous for yeah indigenous ecology yes exactly but grass carp can be so yeah just a yeah. little interesting little tidbit but um but yeah I've, and it's kind of funny because the grass carp I've, I've seen a few in some lakes and stuff around and those things are really skittish, but these were not. I guess because it's in an urban area, they're just so used to seeing people and cars right. and all the noise and just all that stimulation. It's just they just kind of become immune to it, so they don't really scare that easy. So if this is um, if you're wanting to catch a carp and you're just not that good of a caster or kind of a novice or whatever, these fish are pretty forgiving. Or maybe it could just be that I caught them in a very good mood. I don't know. Right. But, uh, yeah, well, I need to make a trip over there and we need to get on them for sure. Did you do that? You do. Yeah, man, we got to do mm-hmm. that. Maybe do a Sam trip too, since we're going to be in the area. I mean, there's, there's right. a lot, there's a lot, bro. I got to take you to the, to the uh, South Lando. I think you dig that place a lot too. Yeah, for sure. I'd love to go out there and do some, some kayak camping. Um, speaking of which I'm, I'm going to be going on a kayak camping trip this weekend, nice. uh, going out to Lake Washington to camp on an Island. So no that's going to be fun. Yeah, dude. I'm so stoked. So um, I got a couple remote design bags coming in, ordered a couple roll tops and a 60 liter uh, dry duffel. Um, I believe they'll be here tomorrow. Um, and I'm going to you know, go out to an island, find some trees, uh, kayak out there, obviously kayak camping um, and then camp in hammocks. Uh, ironically enough, I was looking up, you know, what we we're going to talk about for this episode and Saturday is actually National Hammock Day. So no way. <laughs> I was like, ironically enough, that kind of works out. So I'm actually going to be hammock camping on National Hammock Day. Nice. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we can find a good island, find some good spots to hang some hammocks and uh, camp out. Weather, when I looked at it last week, I think the weather was supposed to be 98 degrees, 80% humidity. Oh, um, that has since changed. So now it's 88 degrees and like 60% humidity. So um hopefully we'll get a little bit of breeze out there and it won't be too brutal um but i'm excited nonetheless i mean lake washington is gorgeous the islands are awesome uh so i'm just ready to be out there and uh go do some kayaking so you be taking yeah i'm gonna uh, do that taking, this weekend taking your girlfriend and the kids yep uh well uh the kids are gonna be with their mom and me and ruth are gonna go out so nice uh yeah we're gonna go out there cook a little bit of dinner we're actually gonna go kayaking with one of my buddies up here um, kind of like a, a double date kayak thing, him and his wife. And then me and Ruth are going to go out there earlier in the day and Saturday, kayak around, go grab some lunch. And then me and Ruth are going to head back to the lake and, um, go out to Island to camp. So God, dude, that sounds like so much fun, dude. I'm stoked for it. I'm going to try to record it and document it. Um, I don't, I don't I got this bug after watching Gatewood's channel so much. I'm like, I, I need to finally start documenting trips, which I've most trips I take, I record but I just never do anything with the footage. Yeah. And I need to change that. Like I have hours upon hours upon hours of footage just sitting on SD cards that I've never done anything with. 
mainly because I'm the type of guy like I'm a perfectionist. If I record something, I want to put out a good product. And if I'm not talking in the video, nobody wants to sit there for 15 minutes watching an action camera view of arms flailing back and forth and picking up a fish. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if there's not a good dialogue in it or monologue for that matter, like I just, I guess I'm not passionate about that style of film. So I don't produce anything with it. It's just, I, I mean, I have all the footage and I guess it could be good for, you know, B roll or, or teaser clips. Um, but I haven't really captured the proper content that I would want to put out. So I'm hoping to change that with, with this trip, you know, cause I have my DSLR and I have, I think three GoPro cameras. I have a couple 3d cam- or not 3d, um, 360 cameras. And I've just, you know, picked them up over the years. Um, none of them are really new and I could, I'm sure I could piece together something. Um, so I, I think I might try that with this weekend trip. Uh, we'll see. Um, but more than anything, I'm just excited to get out there and do something fun. I mean, last weekend, uh, was my girlfriend Ruth's birthday. And so prior to going to Van Buren with her and her family, I took her cousin out the day before on a fishing trip for his, um, it was, it was like kind of a mixture of his high school graduation and birthday gift. And, uh, so we hired a guy to go hit up some water and try to get on some small mouth. <laughs> and it was like raining all week. And we're hoping that it was you know, the weather forecast showed that it wasn't going to rain too much after Thursday. So we were excited about that. Hopefully, the, you know, things would calm down. Water would get a little more clear. Um, levels were looking great. So we were stoked about it. And then we were, we were going to go out Saturday morning, Friday night. This freak storm came through and the guide texted me, Evan, from uh, Washita Fly Anglers. He works at uh, Washita Outdoor Outfitters. He, um, he texted me and said, dude, I don't know what happened, but... The river that we were going to go to went from two foot at the gauge to ten and a half feet at oh, the gauge. Oh no! Completely blown out. Um, <laughs> rose eight and a half feet, and we're like, yeah. So we decided we weren't going to go to that body of water. Went to a different body of water, and we got there in the morning, and it was raining when we got there, and it was just chocolate milk, and it was going. And of course, Ruth's cousin came from you know like three hours away, and so he met us down there. Evan met us down there. He's like, uh. So what y'all think? I said, man, it it doesn't look good. He said, yeah. He said, uh, you know, we can go spend four or five hours on the river and probably won't catch anything. He's like, I, I, I feel bad because, you know, CJ drove three hours to get here. And I was like, yeah. And so I looked at CJ. I said, man, it's, it's your gift. What you want to do? You want to, you want to go and brave the river and not possibly not catch any fish, but maybe we might. Or you want to turn around and head back? And he said, man, let's do it. I said, okay. And so um, I asked Evan, I said, so, I mean, obviously the water's flowing. I said, it's safe, right? Like, we're not going to be in any danger. If there's any risk of danger, like, it's not worth it. He's like, no, 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 the water's safe. He's like, just the the quality of the water is not good. So you're not going to, you're probably not going to catch anything. I said, okay. And so we went out there and we got a couple bites, actually. Um, I missed a couple. CJ missed a couple. But it was a blast. I mean, the, the weather cleared up right when we got on the water a uh, little bit of breeze a little bit of overcast water was chocolate milk so fishing wasn't that great but there was a couple spots by some shoals that we actually had some bites um wasn't able to land them and then right probably about five minutes after we got off the river it just pissed poured on us again so it was like it gave us the perfect amount of time to not get soaked the whole time we were on the raft um great adventure but uh no fish unfortunately so Dude. i might might try to do a little catch and cook this weekend because I didn't catch any fish last weekend, so I got to make up for it somehow. So I might try to do that this weekend. Yeah, dude. Did the graduate? What was his name again? Sorry, CJ. CJ. Yes. Did he have? Did he have a good time at least? He had a great time. Yeah. And and so he's not a fly fisherman. He's always fished conventional. Um, I taught him a couple of weeks ago how to do a basic fly cast, and he he enjoyed it. Um, he enjoyed the fact that it was more of an art rather than just you know flinging something out there. So, um. He actually didn't, he, he fly fished the whole time we were on the raft and he just kept talking about on the way back to Van Buren, how much fun he had and how much more exciting it is to be out there. And he was at the front of the raft the whole time. And, uh, yeah, he, he had a really good time. So hopefully we can get out on the water again and actually get him on some fish. Um, if the conditions are a little better, but, uh, even for not catching any fish, he had a really good time. So I can only imagine when I get him on some fish, what he's going to think. Yeah, that's so awesome, dude. 
Yep. So sucks that it sucks that it blew out, man. But uh, at least he had a good time. Right. Yeah. There ain't nothing wrong with having a good time, even if you don't if you don't catch fish. That's why it's called fishing, not catching. So exactly. But yes, yeah, sir, it's pretty good. But yeah, this weekend's gonna be fun too. Um, and so I was looking up National Hammock Day because obviously I didn't I didn't even know that was a thing. And then I looked it up, and uh, there's a little bit of history on hammocks that I didn't know. So um, the hammock was actually invented by the Mayans. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah. So uh, they were developed by the Mayans in Central and South America. Um, and it was a sling made of fabric, but they typically back then would make it out of uh woven bark from the, the hammock tree. Um, and so they called it a hammockas, I believe if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing that correctly. And that's where the word hammock comes from. Uh, so oddly enough, it's, you know, made from a, a tree bark and hung in trees, <laughs> which I was like, didn't even know that. I didn't even know the Mayans had created them, but that's pretty I'm cool. super excited for that. That's pretty sweet, man. What kind of hammocks are you guys going to use? Uh, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't even know what the brand is. I ordered them off Amazon and they had mosquito nets. So nice. yeah, you can probably <laughs> need those. That's good to have. Yeah. Well, actually I've heard that the islands on Washita don't have mosquitoes. Um, I, I find that hard to believe where there's water. There's uh, usually mosquito typically, but on islands, it's a little different because mosquitoes don't have that far of a flight distance. Uh, so true. That's true. A, for a mosquito to fly a mile from the bank to an island, the only way they would really be able to get there is if they were like riding along with somebody's boat or something like that, because they don't have that long of a flight distance. So I guess I'll find out when I get out there. But from what I've heard, there's not very many mosquitoes out there on the island. That's a good point. Good point. And if that's the case, I'm doing a lot more island camping. <laughs> Dude, I want to go so bad, man. There's so many trips I want to do, but ah, freaking grad school, dude. Hey, Take you're not going to be in grad school forever. You're damn right. So with or without that degree, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's definitely going to happen someday. But uh, weren't you saying something recently about you read an article about uh, some tree, yes. big bend or something like yeah. that? Yeah. So uh, hammocks, trees. I guess it's a good time to bring up this guy. So. Um, in the past, we've done a segment called the Conservation Conversation. We haven't done one in a while, but I figured this would be a good topic for that. So recently, I saw in Texas Monthly that there was a uh, an oak tree that was believed to be extinct being or attempting to be brought back. So 12 years ago, the last known tree, uh, scientific name, Quercus tardifolia, common name, being Chisos Mountains Oak, or late leaf oak, was believed to have died. Um, however, a group of scientists scoured the uh, Big Bend area trying to find more of them, and they found one individual. And uh, so it's no longer extinct. However, it is considered to be functionally extinct, meaning that unless there's a way that they can... Um, bring in more individuals or uh, if there's more individuals that uh, can produce pollen and, and, and allow for uh, breeding that it's essentially going to just die. And once it dies, that there's yeah. nothing they can do. So they're, they're in, in their efforts to find this, this particular species. They also happen to have found another yet to be identified species of oak, which is pretty neat. Um, but yeah, man, so it's pretty, pretty, uh, Pretty successful trip, I suppose. They're trying to find more, and I think they're going to try and graft um, using some methods to graft some more individuals from this one living tree. So it's pretty neat. This tree's making a comeback, and um, those individuals, I believe, they are working for San Antonio Botanical Garden. Michael Eason, associate director of conservation and collections at the San Antonio Botanical Garden, and nationwide team of tree ex experts. Uh, That's awesome. So not him and nine experts scoured Big Ben in search of the last living tree, and they found one. It was so they found one, and they're thinking about grafting it. So yes. I, I'm not a botanist or an arborist. Um, if they were to graft it, would that be something to where the tree could possibly then, like, pollinate itself? Or I mean, obviously, if they if they had two specimens, uh, you know, it can go through the natural pollination process. But with it being a graft of the same tree, do you know how that works? I did not. That's outside the scope of my hmm. understanding. I have no idea. 
Um, I think I know somebody who might know the answer to that. I'll have to ask them. Uh, but yeah, either way, man, this is huge. This is, uh, well, on, on top of finding an ex- a, a tree once thought to be extinct, they found a yet to be named species of tree. So it just kind of goes to show just how much is out there that we just don't know about, which I've always right. find really, really interesting and fascinating. But, um, dude, it, Big Bend is so huge, too. Oh, man. I mean, this the state of Texas is massive, and we've yet to explore every inch. But there's so much out there that we don't know about in the world in general. Like, it's just, I can only imagine, man, how, what, what it's out there that we haven't even just, we haven't even like scratched the surface at. It's, uh, it's pretty right, right, humbling. And, and, uh, but yeah, so pretty cool. Um, this, this tree can make a comeback, but. Uh, aside from that, I guess in, in another in other conservation news, um, some pretty big news. So a also from Texas Monthly, a family turned down millions of dollars so they they can conserve or turn part of their ranch into um, a preserve essentially. So this family had seven hundred plus acres, and they were considering turning a pretty substantial portion of it into a subdivision, which would, which would have uh, turned into some huge gains for them financially. I think a hundred and I forgot the figure was hundred plus million dollars for them. Holy hell. Yeah, dude. I mean, a lot of money, but thanks to parks and wildlife and the nature conservancy conservancy and some other conservation minded individuals and organizations, they were able to purchase 515 acres of land for um, state potentially state parks and uh, just the conservation of pristine hill country uh, um, land, man. So pretty. Dude, that's awesome. Heck yeah, dude. I mean, they paid, I think it was $25 million. That might seem a little steep, but at the same time, you can't make more land. It is what it is. And the exactly. more that we can conserve, the more that we can preserve, uh, I think better. So I, you know, good on Parks and Wildlife and everybody involved. I think right. This is a huge win. Um, and I think it's it's pretty neat that these individuals were actually willing to turn down so much money. I mean, we're talking like life changing for generations type of money to exactly. help preserve this kind of land. And I hope, which I think is awesome. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. And I and I hope that this will. Um, inspire some other people to maybe hopefully do the same um, because yeah at the, at the rate of urbanization that's happening not only across the country but in Texas specifically like the more land that we can we can conserve for future use the better I think exactly and and from that family standpoint or those individual standpoint how awesome would it be to own a piece of property that is directly next to a state park. Like you could literally just leave your house, ride your bike, be in a state park or walk to the state park. Like that would be freaking awesome. Yeah. And to know that you did something that you, you played a part in a new state park being brought to the state and conserving some land. So, uh, I mean, all around just great for, I think all parties involved. Exactly. Pretty freaking awesome, man. It is for sure. Awesome. Well, I guess since we're talking about parks, uh, something I just read from Parks and Wildlife. This was from July 11, 2023. Texas state parks have been recognized among the nation's best. So, really? Yeah, apparently. So, um, let's see. The National Recreation and Park Association, NRPA, along with the American Academy for Park and Recreation Administration, have selected Texas state parks as a finalist for the 2023 National Gold Medal Award for Excellence in Park and Recreation. So I just think That's being awesome. a proud Texan and everything that this is a uh, pretty neat honor to hold. That is for sure. Although I'm not a native Texan, nor do I live in Texas anymore. I still take pride in my 18 years in Texas. So that's freaking awesome, man. Yeah, you do. You're the hard, most hardcore Longhorn fan I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Hook him, baby. <laughs> I'm, I'm always going to be a Longhorn fan. Although living in Arkansas for the past four years, I... I haven't gained a soft spot for the Razorbacks, but uh, if it doesn't affect Texas in one way or the other, I I do root for them. So you're gaining an appreciation. Um, Yeah, I'd say there's an appreciation for them. Um, I was at the Longhorn game uh, up in Fayetteville last year and I had a time of my life. I wish the Longhorns won. They didn't, um, but still had a good time. And I can't wait for 2024 to come and Texas to play Arkansas every year. 
along with A&M and Oklahoma. Like that's just going to be amazing. Those three teams are going to be on our yearly schedule again. And I'm super excited that's for it. It's going to be wild. It's going to be wild. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I guess one more thing, uh, kind of in line with the whole parks talk. So as of July 14, 2023, that's when this was printed in Texas Parks uh, webpage. If you like parks, but you also appreciate art, um, you can actually do both. Uh, so the Art of Texas State Parks Traveling Exhibit is at the Houston Museum of Natural Sciences this summer. Uh, and it will be there uh, through October 1st, I believe. The exhibit features paintings from more than, of, of more than 30 parks from some of Texas's best artists. And along with the exhibit, you can, there's also a commemorative book that you can purchase published by Texas a and Printing Press. And the proceeds from the books will, um, will be donated to Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation to benefit Texas State Parks. So that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. I wish I'd have known that while I was in Houston. Uh, so the right. next time, I think I'm going to go check that out, man. Maybe that'll be a reason for us to, to go to Houston. Let's do it, Although man. I will be in Texas at the end of the month, I don't think that uh, Houston would, would uh, be a, a stop for me. But maybe sometime in august or october because i know october i'm going to be in texas for uh most likely two weekends um i'm gonna try to make it to the red river shootout and then we have that event well those events on the 21st um so yeah Hmm. maybe maybe august might be a month that uh i can come down to houston maybe we go check that out and then do some urban fishing hell yeah man let's do it Yes, sir. And then maybe sometime you can come up here and uh, maybe we could take another November trip on the Buffalo or something. I'm down for that. Also, I'm still trying to work out the uh, the logistics, but I'm going to try and meet you and hopefully Vic next weekend when you come down. Hell yeah. I need to get out of, I need to get out of College Station for a bit, dude. You do. Although you're <laughs> just in Houston, you, you need to get out again. <laughs> hey, man, uh, I'll take any opportunity I can to get out. Right, especially get on the water with some buddies. Heck yeah, dude! It's been I haven't fished with you probably since our Buffalo trip. I haven't fished with Vic. Oh, dude, I'm trying to remember. Probably since our Kingsville days, 2011, 2012. I don't know if I've ever fished with Vic. Uh, huh. Well, this can be a first. Yep. Dude, yep. maybe and maybe we can even have our first in person podcast episode. That would be pretty cool. Uh, my computer is not mobile. So we would have to record on yours. That's cool. So yes, sir. Mine doesn't have a screen. (laughs) It's a, (laughs) it's a, it's a Mac mini and I use my, uh, 75 inch in my living room as my monitor. So, uh, yeah, I can't, can't take that with me, but as long as you can bring your, your setup, uh, that would be awesome. Back to work. But all righty. Well, thank y'all for listening and uh, making it to the end. And like we always say, please like, subscribe, share, um, give us any feedback that you have, whether it be positive or negative. Um, uh, we're, we're real good at taking criticism. I'm sure both of us have had quite a bit of that in our life. So uh, feel free to reach out to us on uh, any of the wildlife outdoor socials or minor Jose's. And uh, thank y'all for listening. Peace. This has been Wildlife Outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors, and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.